there might be hope for the future. Thank you, and congratulations, Liana. Thank you so much, Vicki. Uh, it's great to be able to follow you because I can go very quickly because you said so much so well. Um, it's, you know, I couldn't be more delighted by this book, by the, the opportunity we have to celebrate it. Um, I taught three courses this past semester. I taught the book in every one, and that makes it even easier uh, to talk about it because I knew I loved it when I read it, and then my students said so many brilliant things about it, so I can like, seem smart by just repeating to what they said. That makes me very happy. Um, no, and, and really what I can do, as Vicki said, so much of what is I find important about this book, but I can, I can just point out some examples that I am going to be talking about for the rest of my life to anyone who will listen, because I just think so much in this book is brilliant on a level that, that almost nothing else is. I wanted, you know, I think most of you have probably read it, but just I wanted to share with you. That section called The Big Ass is maybe one of the most brilliant sort of engagements with Jewish history and text that I've ever seen. Um, if you haven't read it, it's a moment in the book that takes a piece of the Torah that I think in almost every interpretation, and in every even like different rabbinic traditions, there's very little to say about it. There's just not a lot to say about like a list of, of whose descendant gave birth to which person, et cetera. Except that the insight that drives this section of the book is that it's a, a list shaped by patriarchy, by an idea that men matter and women don't, and that uh, is such an important lesson for us. It's such an important thing to realize, and it's such a sad and painful thing to realize. And this section of the book is violent and intense and hilarious and just tells that story of the world we live in and the forces that shape it in, with an economy of style that, and, uh, you know, in just a few pages, and I, I really do, can't think of its equal. I can't think of a, another text that speaks as beautifully to this central problem of the world we live in um, uh, as, as sort of uh, this beautifully and roundly and fully. Um, there are many other jokes in this book that I absolutely love. One personal one that a student pointed out to me that I think I've missed, that I hope you didn't miss, is the note on the type at the end of the book, which is just a brilliant, beautiful little little thing that I, I hope you'll you'll look for. Um, I you know there's so many more things I would say. The book at, in my reading with students turns into this uh, story of God's relationship with Lilith and the character of Lilith as developed throughout the book is I think this fascination that I still need more time to unpack and understand. Um, I think is a text that we're gonna keep coming back to. Um, and I wanna, I think I'll just close by saying one other thing to try to capture one other aspect of this book that really, that really matters to me. There's something about the style of it. Um, when I taught it most recently to the class I'm teaching on the history of comics, it occurred to me to pull off the shelf our Crumbs Illustrated uh, Book of Genesis to show the students you know, how these books take this, take this foundational text differently. And it's incredible when you look at the two of those books how differently they make you feel, what they, the different things they tell you. It's not just that on the very first page of our crime's Genesis, God is represented as a man with a big flowing beard, exactly what we get in Let There Be Light when Abraham falsely uh, names God. But it's that the cross hatching, the intensity of the line, the heaviness and weight of Arkham's retelling of Genesis is beyond anything else we're going to say about Arkham, telling you that this is a text that a master has to take care of and present to you and understand, and it's not for you to do this work. That's, that's the message of the virtuosity of that very beautiful work in, in its own way. I think what we get in Let There Be Light is a text with like a very honed personal vision and interpretation of the Torah, but that in its openness of line, in its simplicity, it's, it's sort of um, uh, you know, somewhat misleading simplicity, because obviously it's not a simplicity that's easy to produce. It feels so open, 
it makes you want to do the work yourself. I think that like you read this book and you say to yourself, there are stories here that I want that 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 I want to redraw in my own way. And I think there's nothing that's truer to like the power of these ancient texts, which continue to matter to us, than that that feeling of their text that I can interpret, their text that I can think about, that I can I can make sense of for myself. And I think in that sense, there's there, it's really hard to imagine a more powerful Jewish book than Let There Be Light. And I'm so glad we can be here together. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vicki and Josh, for so eloquently uh, articulating some of the rationale that went behind uh, the selection of, of Liana Fink and Let There Be Light as this year's uh, 20, actually 2022, so it's the award for 2022 Edward Lewis Wallens Award uh, winner. So first, a, a few words of background and biography uh, for Liana as we introduce Liana before we present, formally present uh, the award to Liana. So Liana Fink graduated from the Cooper Union in New York in 2008 and earned a Fulbright Fellowship in Belgium to work on a project about the life of Georges Remy, the cartoonist who created the Tintin books. It was there in 2010 that she first got the idea for her graphic novel, A Print Up Until Brief, which she published in 2014. The graphic novel interweaves illustrations of the eponymous advice column that ran in the Forward or the Forward's newspaper in the early 1900s with vignettes on Fink's imagined conversations with the paper's editor, Dave Kahan. In 2012, she also created a short collage series on the Golem for a tablet, and for several years ran an illustrated column in the Forward Online. As of 2017, she's been a regular cartoonist uh, for The New Yorker, and on Instagram, where I think I see that you now have 600,000 followers, I don't know if that's up to date, but a very robust, <laughs> Uh, following on, on Instagram. Um, she's published three graphic novels, as, as we've heard, A Bintle Brief, Passing for Human, and Now Let There Be Light. And she's the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, a six-point fellowship for emerging Jewish artists, and a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction. She's had residencies with McDowell, Yaddo, the Headland Center for the Arts, and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. This book is a New York Times editor's choice. Uh, Publishers Weekly describes it as uh, an irreverent yet profound retelling of the book of Genesis. Throughout God, it, uh, throughout God and readers are reminded that light cannot exist without darkness or creation without destruction. Fink's exploration offers much light in both senses, levity and illumination. And on the uh, back cover of the book, uh, we have included not praise for uh, Let There Be Light, but praise for the book of Genesis, from which this book is an adaptation, which includes, and maybe we'll talk about this in the Q&A, a quote from Karl Marx describing Genesis as the opiate of the masses. Um, uh, Abraham Ibn Ezra, who writes endlessly interesting, I couldn't put it down. Uh, Pope Alexander VI, who says, almost as good as the sequel, and I could go on, but this gives you a sense for some of the humor and the comedy that we find in here. If I can invite uh, Lawrence Waltman and Marjorie Feldman to join me for the formal presentation of the award. to be here and to welcome all of you on behalf of our parents who founded this award and to, to this very gifted artist, writer, creator of something really very exceptional and very funny. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the Mar Maurice Greenberg Center for Ju Judaic Studies and the Waldman Family present the 1922 Edward Lewis Wallen 
award to Liana Fink for her novel, Let There Be Light, The Real Story of Her Creation, presented this 26th day of April, 2023. When God looked down from her heavenly haunts, she saw the wickedness of man, that everything he thought, and he's thinking, I wonder if there is a kegger I can crash tonight. <laughs> and everything he felt, I'm going to sleep with my neighbor's wife. And then the next one is thinking, murder, 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 with downright evil. It grieved her. And she's thinking, why can't I sleep? Oh yes, men. And she's kind of, a base seconds wave feminist. <laughs> she knew she would not be able to sleep until she destroyed them. There's a certain relief that comes with making a decision, even a horrendous one. There was, however, one man of whom God was very fond. His name was Noah. And she's holding, because as you know, you we're not supposed to depict God, so God is holding a moon over her face so that mankind can't see her. And she says, hi, um, I am the Lord your God. I've made a decision. I am going to destroy the world, and I can't imagine a world without you in it. And he's looking a little <laughs> nonplussed. She told him to build an ark, and she says, make it about yay big. <laughs> she is very big. <laughs> when it's finished, I want you to round up two of every kind of animal and bring them inside. And he's looking more than nonplussed now. Just hurry, she says. The floods are coming. And we get a little glimpse of what the floods are going to come from, which is her eyes. This is the story of God's first love. God loved Noah, and she gently places him back on the ground. She loved him at a time when she hated everything else, including herself. She didn't want to destroy the world, and she starts to rumble. She simply couldn't help herself, and she heaves. But by the time the rains came, Noah, his family, and the animals were all safe on board the ark. Thanks, Amy. Our heroine cried for 40 days and 40 nights. God's love of her creations had eroded imperceptibly over time. There had been the episode with the Tree of Knowledge and the terrible murder of Abel by Cain, but it wasn't until now that the misery poured out of her in all its brutal force. In other ways, though, she was profoundly happy. The way she felt about Noah, it was a new way to feel. As for Noah, who knows if he felt it, too. He must have felt something, though, and he grows a beard. Um, 
all things considered. Finally, it, whatever it was, stopped. She wasn't crying anymore. She no longer wanted to destroy the world. Then she remembered her friend and blew the standing waters away. The ark came to rest on top of a mountain. Noah had been deeply traumatized. He wasn't ready to leave the ark. And he says to the animals, one of us needs to go outside and make sure it's safe. Anyone? <laughs> See their eyeballs. And then you hear a kark. It was the raven. Never more. <laughs> the volunteer flew back and forth above the diminishing waters and finally disappeared. So he says, anyone else? And the elephant and the, the dog. And then someone says, whoo. So he puts out the dove. When the dove returned bearing an olive branch, no one knew it was time to leave the ark but he instead of having a panic attack. <laughs> but he didn't. And he says, nope, no, nah. -uh. Instead, he waited seven more days as the animals get more and more impatient and sent her out again. And this time, she didn't come back. Misery is a sickness. The sickness is contagious. You catch it from the person you love. Noah caught it from God, and he's sitting, muttering to himself, and he's saying over and over, everything is okay, pull yourself together, everything is okay, pull yourself together. <laughs> and when I'm trying to make a reading longer, I read the whole thing. That I <laughs> <laughs> Noah did pull himself together, at least outwardly. After everyone was safely off the ark, he built an altar on which he sacrificed one of God's favorites, the unicorn. And he sobbing while he makes a big burger <laughs> and God and God's like sitting on her cloud being like oh he's he noticed like he's doing this nice he got me flowers or whatever oh thank you Noah you really shouldn't and then she realizes that he's just like lying in a pile on the ground sobbing oh Noah please don't cry Look, Noah. <laughs> and this book was in spot color, which means I just got one color besides black, so I had to label the rainbow. I got, I got to color in red. Da, da, da. And he's sobbing and weeping. Listen, Noah, I stopped crying, and so must you. I will never destroy the world again. And she meant it at the moment. One of the first things Noah did in his new life was plant the vineyard. Thirstily, he watched it grow. When it was ready, he made wine. They had something on it. Then he, finally, there would be relief. And he was drinking it. A quick refresher, in case you forgot. Noah had a wife and three sons, the most obnoxious of whom was named Ham. So here's Ham peering into his father's tent, and his dad is playing the Dancing Queen by Abba. <laughs> and he's peering in, and he runs away laughing. And he finds his brothers, and he says, you guys have got to see what dad's doing. And so they're all standing there now. And Ham says, he's dead drunk, dancing. Now he's dancing to Mamma Mia. <laughs> and the two, one of the brothers, I think Shem, says, Ham, dad has been through a lot. Careful to avert their eyes, Noah's other sons each took a corner of his garments, which is his kid the chef apron <laughs> from roasting the unicorn. And they say, steady now. And walking backwards, draped it over him. Then they put him to bed. And I wrap up the story. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Boy, am I old, he thinks, until the age of 950. How much longer can this go on? At which point he died, finally. God still thinks of him now and then. What is it that made her choose him, of all people? 
To this day, she can't be sure. Thank you so much, Nana. If we can do something. Yeah, I think we'll bring a couple of chairs up. And um, Josh is going to moderate a Q&A with some questions. And we'll try to balance both questions that'll come from Josh, questions that'll come from the audience, questions that'll come from the Zoom, and we'll try to make it work. So Josh, I'm gonna pass this mic. Oh, sure. I think it's working. Pass it to you. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much for that. I I don't know that I've, I've seen a lot of uh, comics creators, artists, reading, doing readings like that. Have you been doing that a lot for this book? Um, I always, is the microphone necessary because of Zoom? Okay, so I, I have seen comics artists read from their work a lot. They usually make kind of a special presentation, but I don't have the patience. So, <laughs> yeah. That's, it, was, it, was very, it was very exciting to see. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I don't know how I'm gonna see questions that are coming on Zoom, so that hopefully someone can figure that out. Um, uh, if there's a way for people on Zoom maybe to submit questions in the chat that we can read, I think that would be great. Um, do you, would you tell us a little bit about how, why, how you started to work on this project? Like, how did it begin for you uh, as a, something that you wanted to take on? This, this character of God originated in a piece I made for the Forward newspaper, which then be later became kind of like a short but important part of a, my last graphic novel before this book, which is called Passing for Human, which is kind of a memoir about um, being a female artist that's a little bit about a fictional version of me growing up, a little bit about a very fictional version of my mom um, growing up and making art. And um, it's a little bit, like I would say magical realist if it were in a graphic novel, but I think in comics, like it's so, you can be so literal about adding magical elements that it's just like normal and real, like Bugs, you would call Bugs Bunny magical realism. Um, but he kind of is, but so there, our shadows come to life and that's part of it, but like the stories are kind of like pasted together with this motif of like this woman god who's like shown as the ultimate woman artist and I loved making that so much. I, I took the text directly from the King James Bible in that version just because it's what I had available on Google. Um, but for this version, it seems to be Christian, um, even though it's very beautiful. Um, and I illustrated it with this kind of naive, childlike woman, like a bullion woman artist character who's like this mixture of like, like, chi like childlike, a bullion joy, confidence, and kind of self doubt and fear, which is how I feel. Like, but I mean, I, I pin it on being female, but really it's just me. That's how I feel. That's where everything I feel comes from, including my art, is this mixture of like huge confidence and huge terror. Um, so that's where it originated. It was my editor at Random House, Andy Ward's idea that I do a whole book version of the book of Genesis with the guide. I would have love to do it. I wouldn't have thought to propose it because I feel like it's been done a lot already. Um, but yeah, but that's where it came from. It's amazing to know that because I guess there is that sense, right? Like it's, it's so, uh, it's been done so much, but that's part of what makes this book so special is that it's, it, it is how you do it. Um, and, and really, I'm so glad, like I'm, I'm so grateful to that person for thinking, for thinking to suggest it. That's wonderful. Um, not always, like not, not always do we appreciate how, how much of an influence like an editor like that can have. Um, I, okay, I am, 
happy to take questions from the audience also, um, and I'll try to take balance that with the chat, and I'll try not to look too confused as I look back and forth, mm -hmm. forth between various things. Um, this question was, I was wondering what inspired you to try to make God seem so relatable, experiencing human emotions. I feel like most portrayals of God show her or him as all powerful, not someone who experiences sadness or has weak moments. Um, I don't know if you want to answer that directly. Or yourself, but. Well, yeah, good question. Um, I think probably, well, the answer is that this is just kind of how I see God, but then the deeper answer is that I just like deeply don't believe in God and I see God as a storybook character. And the deeper answer to that is that I feel strongly that um, that's what it means to be Jewish, which is a very contentious opinion, but um, I come from a line of Jews who are Mitzvahim rather than Hasidim. I, I mean, in my telling of of my ancestry, that's where I come from, like people who are much more into tradition and the text than into actual belief. So it's never, I've never asked myself if I believe in God. And when I say I don't believe in God, like, I don't know if I don't believe in God. I've never thought about it. And I, I plan to never think about it. But <laughs> I love God. God is this character in a book I love. God is the main character in this book I love. That's the main book. and. I started reading this book as a child, and so I have this very childlike vision of God. And I, I guess, like as a kid, when you read something, you're kind of the center of your universe in a way that you're less as an adult, hopefully. So God is me. Like God is me as a child. Um, there's a question up there, but I want to ask a follow-up on that too. The most the easiest path in, I think, adapting the Book of Genesis would not necessarily have Lilith in it as a major central figure. So there you had to sort of push beyond whatever text is easily available to, to think about. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about how Lilith became as central as she is. I tried with this book to, although like I, def, I like failed spectacularly to stick to the original text and to be very, very literal. Um, and in a lot of places, I am being, in my opinion, very literal, although I think it's a very quirky understanding of the text. In some cases, there were problems with the text that I just couldn't solve by being literal, like, the, like drawing it didn't feel honest unless I added something. And in a few cases, the thing I chose to add came from Midrash, um, and Lilith was one of those things. So Lilith is not, she's a character who's not in the actual text of the Torah. She's in stories that were told about the text of the, of the Torah, kind of like folk tales. And the reason she exists is that Adam, um, when there are two tellings of God creating people, in the first version, God makes man and woman both out of mud, and then the story just ends and abruptly starts over with God making a man and then making a woman out of the man's rib. And so the midrash is that Adam actually had two wives, and the first was named Lilith, and she was created alongside him, and she disobeyed him, and God banished her. So I brought that character in, um, I think in this case, partly just because I really love that midrash, and I love that, I, I just wanted another female character. I toyed, or you know, I don't think of Lilith as female, but Lilith is her own thing. Um, I draw Lilith kind of like, I don't I think of them as kind of David Bowie-like, or Bugs Bunny-like, kind of like a little androgynous, although I call her female. Um, I, I toyed with the idea of making some of the patriarchs female, and I just couldn't do it. Like this was a book for me about like running into patriarchy head on and it, and like wrestling with it. So this was somewhere where there really was room to have another female character. Um, and for me, God is kind of a portrait of a very young essence. 
of of selfness, I guess just of myself, just this like our like creative shy child and Lilith, the slightly older self for me. She's um, she's angry, she's very passionate about honesty and she won't let anyone lie even to themselves and she becomes kind of God's enemy in this book because she can tell that God's lying to everyone including herself. God like is allowing mankind to think of God as male in this book and it's because God is kind of like not yet formed in a lot of ways like she's 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 sexist um so the, like the the arc of the book Lilith doesn't appear a ton in well maybe she does I forgot but um, <laughs> the arc of the, the book starts with Lilith and it ends with Lilith and there's a little Lilith in between but Lilith is arguing with God and trying to make God show herself to herself and others. Um, Vicky's question, and actually, all every time I talk the book, students really want to talk about the use of color in the book, and I, I appreciate the way you said that it was spot color. That was like that determined some of the possibilities, but then there's so many choices you make, and I'm, I'm sure we'd all really love to hear more about it. Yeah. Um, Spot color is when you get one extra color besides the black ink of the book, although I think technically you could have just two colors and that might still count as spot color printing. Um, yeah, two instead of the spectrum. Um, and it's cheaper to print and it's much more possible to print it in the US, which means the books don't need to travel, which is good these days because um, Shipping is very expensive and doesn't always happen on time. Um, but I've always done spot color. I don't know, I, I feel strongly that um, I don't like to use color in my work because I wanna tell, I wanna be a writer, I don't wanna be an artist. I'm telling stories with pictures, I'm not making something beautiful. And color is really slow. Um, that's one thing, and I feel like spot color, like the color is a, is symbolic, like you're, um, you're adding a layer of meaning with this layer of color rather than being decorative, although partly I'm just sad that I am not so good at decorating things, but and making things beautiful, I would if I could. Um, I chose red because there are a bunch of red things in the book of Genesis. There's the fruit, which is an apple in this spelling. There's a lot of blood, which the, the begats chapter that Josh mentioned, thank you for praising it so kindly. Um, it, there's a lot of red because they have babies just like bursting out of parts of men's bodies. And the, ra the rainbow has red in it, although it could have really been one of seven colors. Someone told me um, violet is not actually in the rainbow. <laughs> I don't know how many colors there are. There are other, I can't remember what else there is, but there were some like nice, like meaningful rednesses. There's one okay. page where, I, is it at Rebecca, I think? And she's like in an apartment and it's like all red lines. Do you remember that page? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think so. It's one of the reddest pages in the book. <laughs> it's in my memory of it. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that third of the book I rushed through very fast. I had, sometimes when you work with a prose editor and you're a comics artist, um, I haven't done this yet, but I should have. You should push back when they give you a deadline because they don't know how slow comics are to make. So that last third of the book when I was in my first trimester of pregnancy and two, I was rushing to finish this, like rewrite the whole last third of the book in time for a sudden deadline. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to give people here a chance to ask something. Yes, back there. Um, I was curious why you decided to combine the characters of Lois and the serpent. I thought that was a really interesting choice, and so I was interested in like your thought process behind that. Okay, for Zoom, the question was, why combine the characters of Lilith and the serpent? 
I, as a cartoonist, I'm always trying to simplify everything and make everything, every two things into one thing that I can. And I thought like, this would be, their personalities are similar, they're, they're kind of subversive, it would be nice to meld them. And then I thought, but this is also common among cartoonists, like, this is a really good idea. I'm sure someone's had it already, so I Googled it, and people have had that idea already. Like, Lilith has been painted as a serpent. I think all, all the examples I found were Christian, but, like, I, I was proud to have thought of something that's been thought of before. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that combining kind of works with the idea that you have with Leia and Isa, which is a beautiful cocoon. Yeah, it's really amazing. So are there going to be five books? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question was uh, how beautiful the, the treatment of Leia and Isa are, and whether there are going to be more and perhaps five books. Um, so the, what happens with Leia and Isa is that they fall in love at the end of that chapter. Those are the two like unloved siblings, like Rachel's unloved sister and Jacob's unloved brother. And I well, depends how long I live. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so two quick questions from Zoom. One very specific one which is why is Ip Khan's head shaped like a heart in the Middle Greek book? And then the other question is about silent panels, panels without um, any uh, words in them, and how you think about those. So two answers about Ip Khan's head. One, I, according to my mom, had, or possibly still have, a heart-shaped face, and when I was a kid, um, my mom, Harriet Fink, um, Harriet Fink used to draw a heart-shaped Liana Fink on my lunch bag that I would take to summer camp. <laughs> and um, also, Ipkan's face was very, very heart-shaped. It just was, he has a real widow's peak. He's also very cross-sized, I think. Um, as for it, Silent panels. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of them in other books. I don't like. I feel they're kind of splashy. Like oh, like look at me draw. Um, <laughs> but I'm also a really big fan of economy, and I think that if you can tell a story with just one thing, just words or just pictures, you should. So like if you can, if you only need words, just don't illustrate, just have a box with words in it. If you only need a picture, just put a picture, but don't do it to show off. Although I also believe strongly in pacing. I think it's like the most important part of this art form. So if you need to slow the reader down, that's another reason to have some images without words. It's kind of like mo like movies and TV. Um, this question might be uh, a good one to address uh, from one of our listeners on Zoom, um, which is about, did you ever wonder what the reception would have been, was going to be, considering you were retelling and reimagining a religious text? I, I think we've all noticed that people take this book fairly, the, the book you're adapting fairly seriously, <laughs> and I wonder if you felt any concern about, I mean, especially with social media and the way that it's quite easy for people to be very mean, um, if you were thinking about that as you made this. I, I was, I was afraid I would get backlash. I didn't <laughs> because the book didn't, wasn't read by those people. Like if you're, you're, you have to have a be bestseller for someone who wouldn't normally want to read a random indie, like feminist niche book to actually pick it up. I have gotten, I think the, the scariest backlash I've ever gotten was for a Shalom Auslander op-ed that was published in the New York Times that I illustrated with an image of a very, in my opinion, very adorable God kind of being Godzilla and, and like walking around stomping on Manhattan. Um, <laughs> but like I got some real threats to that and that was, 
scary. But in general, my haters are are um, infighters on the left as opposed to people from the right. And after getting those hate emails from the right ones, I would like to keep it that way. I appreciate the question uh, from Brenda, and I just want to follow up on sort of this, this issue of a, whether it's a religious retelling or reimagining of a religious text. And there's, I love your, your author's note at the end. Um, um, and there's a few things that you write that are quite striking about uh, the genesis of, of this retelling. And you say um, that for you, uh, giving God a new gender, my own, was my first step toward reclaiming this work of literature for myself. And then you, you also write that your real aim in making this book is to demonstrate that each of us is allowed to create God or gods in our own image. And that we must reshape the larger stories that are handed down to us, family stories, religious and cultural stories, our individual and collective past, and tell them in a way that feels honest to us. Stories need to be told and retold in different voices. That is how they breathe. And I, I'll tell you, one of the things that's striking, we always have these discussions about sort of how do we define what is Jewish literature? This is technically a, an award for Jewish literature or Jewish fiction. And you alluded to the concept of Midrash. But also, there is this question about sort of the, the religious and how we define what is a religious text or a sacred text or a holy text. We also suggest that this is, in some sense, a reclaiming of that text, a, a reclaiming of a text that cannot become ossified and fossilized but has to live on. And the way that it lives on is by breathing new life into it. And so I guess this is all long prologue to ask, do you see this rewriting as sort of giving new life to a religious text? Is it a secular reclaiming of a traditional Jewish text? Is it something else? How would you define that, that process? I think there are so many right ways I could answer this question, but I'll do one. Um, it's a really good question. I think of this book as a very my very personal way of finding my way into something that I know is mine, but I have never really been able to express in a certain way. And I I describe it as, as a, a version of the book of Genesis with a female God, because I think part of why I can't, like I, I could never sing at, at synagogue or or like I, I don't know I was always very passive a very passive Jew although I was always steeped in it since I was a kid. Um, so so yeah so gender plays a role but I also I think a maybe a bigger part of this God is that she's shy I think the reason that I felt I couldn't quite fit into my religion is that it's such a social religion. And like, my reason for not being able to sing at synagogue isn't because I was a girl, it's because I was shy. Like, I couldn't sing in public. And yeah, and like, so much of what brings you together with your group of people is being comfortable in a group of people, which I'm still really not. But another way to feel close to to Judaism is to engage with the text. And I think there's a lot of, oh, most people do that in a group, but I'm finally admitting to myself by making this book that you can do it alone, and that counts. Uh, I was glad that you read aloud from the Noah part, because I found that particularly moving the heartbreak of it. Um, and I was curious how you decided that that should be a love story and a, a sad love story. Great question. Noah might have been my favorite part to work on because it's so short. Like there's so much happens, but um, in so few words, and it's not like, I, 
Abraham was the hardest part for me. It is so drawn out. There's so much that's a little boring and you don't really know what's important and what's not and it's hard to condense it. Um, but Noah, I don't know, I feel like that was the essence of Noah, that God just like loves, hates everyone, loves this one guy, do, like does makes this dramatic act of destroying the world and saving this one guy. No one really understands why. I'm sure the guy doesn't really understand why. And it just like, it very much rang to me of being, having a crush as a teenager <laughs> and being irrational and like, like making these grand gestures that probably aren't appreciated and probably are scary um, and having big feelings like it all just it all like it all worked it all it, the overlay worked one thing and I, I'm not sure that there's like a an interesting answer to this but I know there were some stories in the book of Genesis that you maybe would have wanted to include but that just couldn't work in, in some way um, I don't know if, it's, if there's something to say about what happened when you tried or why it wouldn't work. Oh, there is one thing I meant to add about the Noah story is that I have God slowly aging throughout the, the book of Genesis. So she starts out as like a little girl, and even though she doesn't really look like a little girl, she grows to be, let's say, 20 or 17. Um, and then so the Noah story it just was, it was the right time to have her have this crush. There, I, I've had Abraham like at least twice as long and I cut a lot of it at the last minute. I cut Hagar, I cut Lot, I cut all of Lot. There was a lot of Lot. I cut other things too, but mostly from Abraham. It was taking over the book and I was spending a lot of time trying to make, like, explain things that could fly. Like, oh, because Abraham, I have Abraham taking place in the present. Another thing I do in this book is that it's cut into thirds. The first third ostensibly takes place in the far past. The middle third takes place in the present. And the final third takes place in the future. And Abraham takes place in the present. And, like, I just couldn't, like, explain slavery in a way that was like funny and light. I like I could have added three hundred pages and really gotten into it, but that would have run away with the book. So Hagar was really hard to really I mean cutting it out wasn't the right thing to do. Um, but I couldn't find the right thing to do with it. So I cut it out. Did you think about the story of Dina? Because that's one of, obviously one of the most difficult stories in that text too. I didn't even consider putting Dina in. I don't like <laughs> I don't like Dina, and I don't want to wrestle with it. I think I read in a Robert Alter book that um, Dina was just like pasted into the Torah to explain. Uh, I forget what it was meant to explain a war and dynamics between the tribes of Israel and it was just like very blatantly made up to explain some things that were happening at the time it was written. The story of Dina is there's a rape and there's um, a lot of murders and like it's like gory without drama. It's not enough drama. <laughs> it's like very gory and very horrible and like I don't know. It's not like it's not cathartic, but I just turned Dina into like one of the siblings, and that felt like a nice catharsis for her. Like I, I turned her back into one of Jacob's children. And that felt really good. Yeah, if she can if she can just be that. I think yeah. That's probably her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's a question way back there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I was interested in your research process for writing this book, because obviously it makes a lot of like specific references to like Midrash and like um, it references Kabbalah like a couple of times. And so I was interested in like your research process and also how you decided to what to pull from sources outside the Torah. 
So the question is about the research process and things like Kabbalah and other things. And um, thank you. Good question. I'm really lucky to be part of a family that's much better educated than me in Judaism and in everything. So my parents suggested the part about Tzimtzum, and I feel like that's like a really important part of the book. And, and other, I think a lot of other small parts as well. I'm not a great researcher. I love, I love Midrash, and I would love to read more of it, but I didn't do, I, I didn't do um, thorough research. I'm glad that I didn't do research on biblical commentary, because I really wanted to keep this book like naive, a naive straight reading of the Torah and um, I kind of like intentionally didn't read it, read commentators, but I would have liked to let more story in, I think. It made me think, and it's strange to me that I haven't thought of this, of how, how interesting it would be for a little kid to read this version of those stories, because it's very close to a kid's perspective, mm -hmm. and certainly, I'm 100% sure my kids would laugh very hard at the big act section. They would like it a lot. And that's very exciting to me that I get to go home and do that. Um, any last questions that people want to ask uh, before? Yeah, please. I'm just curious about your process of actually drawing. Do you sit down and draw these are originals over here that we're looking at? Yeah. Do you use computer at all? The question is about how the, process, the actual artistic process, how the drawings are. I did use computer for this book. It was an experiment, and after using it, I decided I don't do that. <laughs> and I wish I had it. But I, I was using um, a program called Procreate on the iPad for a bunch of it. Um, my, I always want to do the simplest thing, and the reason I was trying the iPad is I thought it might be even simpler than paper. But I find that the simplest way to work is on paper, um, I trace, I use a light, a light box. They're really cheap and really light these days. They're like $20 and um, you could stick it in your backpack. It's probably, I don't know, it's probably half a pound or something. It's like an LED, thin LED plastic screen. Um, so I'll draw a rough draft of something. I use, a, I use like a T-square ruler to mark out um, the boxes, the panels, just the corners, and then I hand draw between them. It's kind of a math problem to figure out the size of the boxes. I'm, I, I wasn't there yet when I made this book, but I now prefer a slightly vertical box to make room for words and pictures. And um, then I draw it as messy as it needs to be. I mean, first I'll maybe write something out, but then with little breaks, like, like you would when you're transcribing poetry, um, and then I'll, I'll rough it, I'll just draw it into boxes and like scribble in a picture and then trace it a million times, adding detail, thinking about it, moving things around. So it's kind of like editing something on Microsoft Word. It's, it's, it really, it's as much of an approximation of writing as I could get to. Okay, well, I want to say thank you so much for doing this, for talking to us about the book. I, I, I honestly feel like I could keep asking you questions about it, but I also think it's a book that speaks so powerfully for itself, and I think it's important that we give it a chance to do that. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Such a fun evening, uh, hearing from you um, in teaching your work in my American Jewish literature class. Uh, the questions that came up about the use of color, the images, the significance, um, it's so useful to hear you talk about um, 
these questions and many more. I know some of my students um, had in, or are here in the room or on Zoom and ask questions, so thank you so much for answering those. But also, this has just been so wonderful to hear the insider perspective of how you created and why, and uh, even talking about why Abe Kahan's face is in the shape of a heart in Vinville Creek, right, to get those details. So um, on behalf of everyone at the Greenberg Center, on behalf of all of the judges, uh, thank you so much. And for everyone in person and on Zoom, thank you. Um, and we will see you soon. So everyone, have a great night, and thank you for coming.